G'day friends, it's Andrew here from Nature's Image Photography and in this video I'm taking another look at the Leica Panasonic 12-60mm lens on my Lumix G9 uh, and in particular I want to look at the close-up capabilities of this lens. Uh, now when I first bought the lens a couple of years ago I made a YouTube video about it um, and in that video I said that uh, this is not promoted as a macro lens necessarily but it does a darn good impression of one. Uh, now let's explore quickly why that is. You have a 60mm lens uh, uh, now on a, on a um, micro four thirds camera, uh, 25 millimeters is the standard lens. So 60 millimeters is a decent level of telephoto uh, magnification. Uh, it's akin to 120 millimeters on a full frame camera and it can get very, very close to the subject. Uh, the minimum focus distance on this lens is uh, 20 centimeters. Now that's not 20 centimeters from the subject to the front of the lens, it's 20 centimeters from the subject to the sensor. Uh, but that means you can get your camera this close uh, to your subject and still be able to get it in focus. So it does get very, very close. Um, so as I said a couple of years ago, it's not necessarily a macro lens, but it does a darn good impression of one. And in this video, I'd like to explore that. Now this is not just a video about the 12 to 60 millimeter lens, it's also a video about macro photography. Well macro if you consider this to be um, a macro lens. Uh, so I'll be showing you some of my uh, techniques uh, along the way. Now that means even if you don't have micro four thirds gear, you might still find something of interest uh, in what you'll see over the next few minutes. But of course if you do have a Lumix G9 with a Leica Panasonic 12 to 60 millimeter lens, I'm sure you'll be interested to see the techniques but also the quality of um, the results results. So at the end of the video I'm going to be showing you uh, quite a few photographs. I'll show you some uncropped photographs so you can get a genuine sense of how close I actually got to the subject and I'll be including my camera uh, settings as well so you can see the, ex the exposure settings I've used. Now if you're new to my channel, if you haven't been here before, I would certainly invite you to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and if you learn something from this video or from other videos like it in my playlist and you'd like to support what I'm doing, uh, you can always buy me a coffee and I'll put a link in the information below. Now I don't do this kind of close-up work all that often uh, and when I do I'm pretty much always surprised all over again by how close I can get with this lens. Uh, so I'm working handheld here at the moment, I'll come in with this flower and I'll focus from there and I think that's pretty close. But if it's a very small flower or if there's a little insect on the flower and I want to get closer, um, my instinct tells me this is about as close as I should be able to get, but I can get closer and closer and closer, you can hear that focus beep going off, and closer, and closer, and closer. And it's only about here that the focus is struggling. So from this far away, I can still get consistent focus. So for a general purpose lens, that's actually pretty remarkable. But it also raises one of the issues um, about macro photography in general. Um, and that is the closer you get to the subject, the less depth of field you have. That's just basic theory. Um, so in macro photography, one of the biggest challenges you face is you don't have enough depth of field. And strangely enough, that's one of the areas where um, these cameras give us a bit of an advantage because the smaller sensor tends to favor a bit more depth of field. Uh, critics of the micro four third system uh, often uh, comment on the fact that you don't get the same soft bokeh effects in the background in certain circumstances um, because of that uh, bit of extra depth of field that naturally comes with these cameras. But for close-up photography it can be a bonus because if you're dealing with a style of photography where the depth of field is naturally just a little bit too shallow for what you want, having a camera that tends to favour that little bit of extra depth of field can be a bonus. So let's take a look at what I think are the two biggest issues uh, we face with macro photography. The first one I've mentioned already is depth of field. You don't have any. Um, so you have to know how to use your, your settings uh, and your, your theory to get around that. Um, the other is uh, camera shake. Now if you are shooting something that's this big from this far away and the entire frame of your photograph might be that far across, it doesn't take much camera shake to destroy a photograph. So. Uh, if you're going handheld, you tend to need very fast shutter speeds. Uh, if at all possible though, I like to use a tripod, um, simply because a tripod takes away the issue of camera shake. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of tripod work now, uh, and I guess I'll talk you through um, what I'm getting at as I go through the process. Now I've made sure my image stabilizer is off. Uh, you want to have your, your stabilizer off when you're doing tripod work. Um, 
because the image stabiliser tries to undo a certain amount of camera movement and if there is no camera movement uh, the image stabiliser can actually cause the problem it's trying to create so I'll turn that off. Um, now the great thing about a tripod is that right now with my aperture wide open um, I can shoot this photograph at about a 3 20th of a second. Um, now that's not bad, I would prefer to go faster if I was handheld, um, but of course that's with the aperture wide open. And if I've got the aperture wide open, my depth of field is minimised. Now, as we said, one of the issues with macro photography is that um, you often want more depth of field than you otherwise get. And one way to do that is to close your aperture down. So if I turn my aperture down to f8, uh, I'll go to f9. That increases the depth of field, but I've got to slow my shutter speed down uh, to get the same exposure. So now I'm down to a hundredth of a second. Now, at that kind of speed, you'd really struggle to get a handheld photograph. With a tripod, it's easy. But of course, um, that only works if your subject's not moving. A tripod will eliminate camera shake, but it won't stop the subject from moving. Now, it's not a particularly windy day at the moment. In fact, it's probably the, the stillest day we've had for a while. But there is a, still a tiny bit of breeze. So I've got to choose my moment fairly carefully here to try to catch the moment when the flower's not moving at all. And happily, it's happening right now. So the great thing about the tripod is that it allows you to, uh, it gives you the freedom to choose the settings you'd like to use uh, instead of forcing you to always have your aperture wide open to go for the faster shutter speed. You get a lot more option to, uh, to choose settings that suit the kind of photograph you're trying to take rather than being limited to a wide open aperture every time. Okay, at this point some of my astute watchers might have picked me up on my first mistake. If I'm using my tripod, shouldn't I also be using some remote system to make sure the camera is perfectly still when I take these photos? Well, you're quite right, I should be. In my defence, I was rushing to get this part finished because I had to get my daughter to an appointment. Luckily, I have a very steady tripod that holds the camera really firmly in place. But for the record, if I did my job right, I'd be telling you to make sure you don't touch the camera when you take a photo. And you can do that one of three ways. You can use a cable remote, but I don't have one of those. You can use the two second delay release mode, or you can use the Lumix Sync app. And if you don't know what that is, I recently made a video about it, so I'll put a link in the details below. So I've just taken a third photo at f11 at a 60th of a second. Uh, now that kind of slow shutter speed I'd never try to do handheld, but on a tripod uh, it's easy. Um, and again, that's the sort of thing that uh, is great about using a tripod with macro photography. You can choose the settings you want almost at will, uh, rather than being stuck with um, a wide open aperture and a fast shutter speed. But of course that really only works uh, if you're not chasing moving subjects and if it's not a windy day. This is working now because things are quite still. Um, but in different conditions or with different subjects, when you're dealing with moving subjects, you do often have to go to much faster shutter speeds with a handheld camera. Uh, so uh, next we'll have a look at that. Uh, and for that, I think we'll go to a different location, look at some different subjects uh, in order to uh, add a bit more variety to, um, to what I've got to show you. So I've come now to a place called Montville. Uh, it's about half an hour from where I live, which is where I filmed the first half of this video. For the record, Montville's where I used to have my gallery, so if you went up those stairs over there, uh, top of the stairs, uh, you'd be pretty close to the back door of my old building. Now, when I had the shop, I used to come here a lot. Uh, I take a philosophy that where there's water, there's life, and these ponds have always um, provided a, a good source of uh, macro subjects. Uh, lots of uh, frogs and, and little bugs of all description. So this is where I've decided to film the second part of the video. So new day, new location, bright sunny weather, and I've even put on a clean shirt. So let's go see what we can find. Okay, the insects are a little bit flighty at the moment and I don't want to spend the whole afternoon uh, filming myself photographing things that have flown away before I get the chance to say what I have to say. So I've decided to use some of these little delicate ferns as my first subject for some of the points I want to make about techniques for handheld close-up photography. 
Here I should be showing you a clip about shutter speed, but someone started mowing their lawn nearby and despite my best efforts you could barely hear what I was saying, so I'm recording this part of my desk. When you go handheld, your only option for eliminating camera shake is a fast shutter speed, and I definitely recommend switching your image stabiliser back on too. In the past, with my old DSLR cameras, I didn't feel comfortable shooting close-ups at anything slower than around a 500th of a second, and faster if possible. With the G9 and the Leica Panasonic 12-60mm lens, you have that excellent dual stabiliser system, where lens and body work together to give you up to 6 stops of stabilisation. So now I can get away with somewhat slower speeds. As you'll see in my sample photos at the end, I got some pretty successful images at speeds as slow as a 200th of a second. Now, that need for a very fast shutter speed brings us to our next issue. Uh, I think most people uh, would understand why I don't want to pump the ISO way up. Uh, so having that very fast shutter speed pretty much means having the aperture wide open, as wide as it'll go a lot of the time or close to it. Uh, it's not like a tripod where you can close the aperture down several stops to increase the depth of field. Uh, to get the fast shutter speed, I want to have the aperture wide open. But when you combine uh, getting very close to the subject with a very wide aperture, your depth of field is minimised. So um, with this sort of photography you have to find ways to, to deal with the probably the narrowest depth of field you're ever going to work with. And this brings us to the third uh, factor I want to talk about, and that's focus. Uh, now, your focus has to be very, very precise, especially with this kind of photography. Uh, now, because your depth of field is so shallow, a millimetre or less sometimes, uh, that means your focus has to be pinpoint perfect, because if it's out by a millimetre, your subject's going to be soft. Now, that in itself doesn't sound all that challenging, but remember you've got a handheld camera, you've got a body that you can't keep perfectly still, the wind might be blowing a fraction, um, and if things are out by a millimetre you've lost it. Now I've got my little tiny edge of the fern here. If I bring myself into here and I can get it in focus, that's great. But you ask yourself, how long can you stand like that over a subject at a kind of an awkward angle without moving one millimetre? and the answer is not very long. So you need to find some, some techniques that let you focus, get the focus sharp um, and press the button when the subject is perfectly in focus. First let's have a look at how I do this uh, using autofocus. Uh, now the first thing I would do is uh, put my autofocus area mode down to one area and make the area as small as possible. Uh, I want to make sure that I focus on the head of a bug and not the back end of it. Uh, and because we're talking about millimetres, it can make a difference. So if I make the focus area as small as I can, it gives me the best chance of getting the camera to focus exactly where I want it to. Um, now your autofocus mode, um, I guess there are two ways to go about it. If you're using the front button to focus, I would suggest switching your autofocus mode to AFS, autofocus single, uh, because that allows you to focus and as long as you keep your finger on the button, the focus will stay locked. Um, now I'm using back button focus and with back button focus I'm in AFC but if I take my thumb off the, the button the focus stops moving so it virtually locks the focus uh, in a different way. Uh, now what this does is um, it, it keeps the focus locked. Uh, remember I just said it's very very hard to focus on a point and keep it focused uh, for very long but what I can do, let's just get that in focus, is focus once and maybe snap off a couple of shots but then rest my shoulders because you really can't stand over a subject for, for any great length of time and expect to keep it still. But now the focus is locked, it's not going to move. So I can stand back um, or I'm ready to take a few more shots. I can just come in and in that moment when it looks sharp I can fire off a couple more shots. Um, now that to me can be a lot easier than trying to stand here for any length of time and really expect to keep that sharp because you just can't help your body moving a millimetre here or there. But if I focus, I can come back, relax, come back in and in that moment when it looks sharp, I can fire off a couple more shots. Now while we're talking autofocus. Uh, for a lot of this sort of photography I find myself having to use the near shift function uh, which I've got enabled to one of the function buttons on the front of the camera. With the near shift focus um, 
you can understand sometimes the camera will try uh, to will struggle a little bit to figure out whether it's got to focus on the object nearer to the camera or a little bit further away if there's a bit of a, an overlap between your closer subject and something behind it so when I come into focus on the end of this fern which is right in front of me here the camera sort of goes straight to focusing on this area back here but if I click the near shift uh, function then the focus snaps straight to uh, the nearer object. Uh, it's a very quick and easy way of making sure that uh, the focus isn't always distracted by the thing going on behind your subject. Now, I've actually made an entire video about near shift focus before, so uh, rather than go into it in depth now, I'm going to put a link to that in the uh, details below. Now there's another option of course too with focus and that's manual focus and I know a lot of photographers prefer to use manual focus with macro uh, partly because it lets them do pretty much what I talked about before uh, with autofocus locking the focus in place. So I'm going to switch the dial on the back now to manual focus uh, which means now I've got to turn the focus ring here to, to focus on my subject. But I've got a couple of focus assists which make it easier for me to, fo to get my subject in focus. So I've done that now. So now that that's sharp, once again, I don't have to stand here for any great length of time. Uh, I can get it in focus, I can take a couple of shots, but after a while your back gets tired. <laughs> Mine does. So then I'll want to stand up and I'll rest my shoulders. Sometimes your bug might be facing in the wrong direction and you've got to wait for it to turn around. But the focus isn't going to change because it's manual focus. Unless you physically turn that ring, the focus won't change. So you can stand up, you can take a breath, and when you're ready, you can come back in, knowing the focus will be exactly where it was before, and you can fire off those couple of shots. So manual focus for a lot of people is an easier solution in the world of um, macro photography, uh, sometimes than using autofocus. Now in between shooting little clips of this video, I've actually been photographing some little tiny damselflies that are getting around in the, the bush here. They're, they're almost like a little tiny dragonfly. Now uh, it has raised uh, a question I wanted to talk about though, and that is um, trying to get a, a larger subject in focus. Now when I say larger, a damselfly is only about this long, but if you consider that your depth of field is only a millimetre or so, uh, then that can be a lot to try to get in focus. Uh, if I've got a damselfly there and it's angled that way, uh, it can be very difficult for me to get the whole thing in focus. If I get down here and I focus at this end of it, that end of it's going to be out of focus. Um, now, there aren't really any easy camera solutions to that problem, uh, but there is one fairly uh, simple and logical solution, and that's just to change my own angle. Um, because if I can get my camera parallel to the subject, then I've got a pretty good chance of having the whole thing in focus. So if I've got my subject there and I'm it's focusing on the head and the back is out of focus. All I have to do is move my camera around to here, change the angle, and I can get um, the whole damselfly in focus. I can focus on one end of it and hope the entire thing will be in focus. Having taken a couple of photos, I'll show you a couple of those in the examples so you can see the difference. So before we finish, I want to make a little disclaimer. Um, I keep on using the word macro throughout this video. I know this is not really a serious macro lens, and I'm sure serious macro photographers would scoff at some of the, uh, the ideas uh, and the ways I've been uh, talking about macro in this video. Um, hardcore macro photographers can take a photograph of a bug's eyeball. Um, I'll settle for the whole bug. Um, uh, but let me explain the value of this lens to me in terms of the close-up. Now, in the past and in the future, uh, I host photography tours. I haven't done any for a couple of years, but I've got one coming up. Now, in all my previous tours, I've always carried a, um, a macro lens, um, even though I've hardly ever used it. Maybe half of 1% of the time, I'd actually do any macro photography on a tour. The rest of the time, it's just dead weight I'm carrying around in my camera bag. Um, and when you're traveling, weight can become uh, an, an issue. Uh, so. With this lens, uh, it does my landscapes, it does my people photography, and on those rare occasions when a really good close-up opportunity comes along, it'll do for that too, at least for my purposes. Uh, and for me, that's fantastic. Uh, it's just one less thing I have to carry, um, and one less lens I have to change when I want to switch from one kind of photography to another. Um, that's very valuable to me. You can judge for yourself whether that's valuable to you.
Now I think you can see the light has changed quite a lot since I started making these clips. Uh, we are getting towards the end of the day and while there is still some light I'd like to get in and take a few more of these photos. So I guess we'll call that uh, the end but watch right to the finish now because I'm going to show you uh, those photographs and the camera settings I used. Uh, so uh, watch uh, for those uh, and I'm also going to produce a companion video to this one where I'll pick out one of the best of the shots and I'll show you my editing process from start to finish from Adobe Camera Raw, uh, sorry in Adobe Camera Raw right from the original raw file through to the the finished product. Uh, that'll come fairly soon as well as a companion to this video. Uh, but for now uh, I'm Andrew Goodall, this is Nature's Image Photography, thanks for watching.